Now, the thing to recognize is you think about this read-only and read-write culture, it's not as if the future is going to be either one or the other. What we're increasingly seeing is the way the future is both of these things together. The future is a future increasingly mixing read-only and read-write culture, increasingly producing a hybrid between the two as people use digital technologies to speak in the way Sousa celebrated. But the problem here is that the law does not fit this extraordinarily optimistic practice. The law has a very different attitude about these two forms of creativity. While the law is designed to endorse and protect read-only culture, the law is designed to reject the freedom of read-write culture, weakening this read-write culture. Now, why is that, you might ask? And the thing to recognize is there's a very simple technical reason why the law opposes this read-write creativity while embracing read-only creativity. And the answer has, the reason for this has to do with the architecture of copies and architecture of copyright law. So if copyright law at its core regulates something called copies, <clears throat> what we know about digital technologies is that every single time you use some bits of culture, you are producing a copy. Now, that is a radical change over how we experience culture before the digital age. For example, think about a book in real space. If these are all the uses of a book, an important set of these uses are just technically unregulated by the law. So if you read a book, that's not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book, because to read a book is not to produce a copy. To give someone a book is not a regulated use of the book because to give someone a book is not to produce a copy. In the United States, the law explicitly exempts selling of books from the reach of the copyright owner because to sell a book is not to produce a copy. To sleep on a book is not an act regulated by any copyright system because to sleep on a book is not to produce a copy. These uses of this creative work are then free and balanced against a set of uses which the law of copyright purports to control in order to create the incentives that create creators need to produce great new work. So if you want to publish a book, you need permission of the copyright owner because to publish a book is to produce a copy. And then in the American tradition, there's these thin slivers of exceptions, uses called fair uses, uses which otherwise would have been regulated by the law because they involve making a copy, but which the law says ought to remain free. So for example, you can quote a passage in a book, in a review of the book, a critical review, because though there's a copy involved, the law says that type of copying should be privileged. Enter the internet, where the basic architecture of digital technologies is that every single use produces a copy. And we go from this world of a relative balance between free uses and regulated uses to a world where presumptively every use is regulated merely because the platform through which we get access to our culture has changed. So it's in this sense that the law supports read-only culture, law supports the business model of read-only culture, because if the law regulates copies, then it's giving perfect control over every time a copy is made in this digital environment. And it's for this reason the law rejects read-write culture, renders it illegal, because in the production and dissemination of read-write culture, there is a copy made which has not been authorized by the copyright owner. So DJ Dangerbaus knew that the Beatles never give permission to remix their works, didn't even try to secure the permission. This kid found that when he could wow Can for $218, it would cost more than $400,000 to clear the rights to the music in the background of the stuff that he had remixed in order to distribute it broadly. Increasingly, AMVs are finding notice and takedowns from lawyers who are representing artists who don't like the fact that their work has been remixed in this particular way. And this still is my very favorite favorite example. I don't care what you think about Tony Blair. I don't care what you think about George Bush. I don't care what you think about the war. <clears throat> the one thing you can't say about this video made by this extraordinary creator, Johann Soderberg, is what the lawyers said when Soderberg asked permission to remix these images with this song by Lionel Richie. The lawyer said, no, you cannot have our permission because, quote, it's not funny, end quote. <laughs> 
So the point is the law supports the read-only culture and rejects the read-write culture. Now, the thing we need to recognize here is number one, no one in a place like this, the United States Congress, or in a place like this, ever thought about this fact about the way digital technologies interact with copyright law. There's no such thing as the ATM RICA Act, the Act to Massively Regulate Every Creative Act Act. What we've got instead is the unintended interaction between an architecture of regulation and an architecture of technology producing this space of in principle perfect control. And number two, we need to recognize that there is a wide range of creative work. So there's creative work like this, and creative work like this, and creative work like blogs like this, and creative work like this. Some of that creative work is professional, some of that creative work is amateur. And certainly the professional is dependent upon the copyright system to produce the incentives necessary to support that professional creativity, but the amateur creativity is often not. Indeed, not just not dependent upon the copyright system, the copyright system is increasingly affirmatively harmful to this form of creativity. Nonetheless, the business model of Hollywood, the business model that presumes everyone needs the perfect control of the read-only culture, is getting applied across the full range of this creativity. Ignorance of the way that that business model destroys certain forms of creativity. So while it might help in the context of this kind of creativity, this model of control uh, would really, really hurt other forms of creativity as the creativity cannot begin to clear the rights necessary even to express itself in a non-commercial amateur way by people.